some of our campers here. Oh, thank you. Or there we go. Uh, we do have some of our campers here this morning. Some have their t-shirts on, I noticed. And so I would like to ask those, those of you guys who are here that went to camp, if you, got, if you all would come up here. Now, you don't have to say anything. If, you're, if you don't want to say anything, but we would like to hear, if you do have something to say about camp, we would like to, but we would like you to come up anyway and and, uh, and be with her. I know Kaylee and Nevea and Reed and Brianna are here. We also had three others, Beckett, Matthias, and Paige. Paige. So, but you guys are going to do a good job of representing today. So does someone want to talk about what you learned or thought about camp this week? Kaylee is moving away from the mic. <laughs> Nevaeh? Yeah. Okay. That was our verb. That was our theme verse. If any man would come after me, let him take up his cross daily, deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Anybody else read? Brianna, Kaylee, now, you should have heard these guys at McDonald's <laughs> on the way home. In fact, we had an older couple that came by specifically at the table and said, we wanted to see what this, th th this is the chatterbox table. What would you say? This is, the, this is the, the chattering table or something like that because they were really talking. So maybe that's not what you wanted to share this morning, but it was, it was really a, really a, Great time, a fun time. They learned a lot about the about the Lord. Scott Gilbert, our camp pastor, did a great job. Uh, but I don't want to be the only one else that talks besides today. Anybody else? How about what was your favorite part of camp? Yeah, favorite part of camp. Everybody was so nice. All right, excellent. Read your favorite part. Rihanna, your favorite part. Swimming. They spent a lot of time in the pool. Actually getting to go. You know, let's turn that mic on again. It, it wasn't really on. Brianna said? Swimming. Swimming. And Reed said? Actually getting to go. Actually getting to go. And what he means by that is we haven't had kids camp since 2019. This was the first children's camp at Grand Oaks since that time. And so everybody was new. And so give, give them a hand for, for going and for sharing. But do we have a song? A theme song? We're going to sing the theme song. Remember that song? Let's Follow Jesus. Every year for the last 21 years, something like that, uh, Kyle has been the music director for uh, Children's Camp and has written a song for each, each year, I think. Right. So Except for the last three. Yeah, so we would have everybody give us a ticket shot at it. Real easy to learn, so stand up really quick, okay? Everybody, you're all children today. That's right. That's right. Let's follow Jesus. Let's follow Him every night and day. Let's follow Jesus. Let's follow Him all along the way. Whoops. Let's deny ourselves and let's take up this cross, seeking after Jesus, whatever the cost. Let's follow Jesus. Let's follow Him. Now you can join in. Ready? Let's follow Jesus. Let's follow Him every night and day. Let's follow.
We do want to encourage you to uh, open your open your bulletin for just a minute, and you'll find inside a sermon guide, which you'll need a little later on. But there's also a perforated section that we'd like to ask you to just tear that off together. And this is primarily for those who are here for the first time or the first time in a long time, where it says welcome. If you would give us a record of your visit and any other information you'd like to share with us, we would sure be happy for that. Include the date if you can. Sometimes that doesn't get included, and uh, we sometimes have to remember or guess on that. But any, anything you would like to share there, and then there's a place on the reverse side to record any uh, decisions or requests for information or prayer requests, etc. At the back of the sanctuary is a place marked offering box, which is... Obviously, they're also for offerings if you came prepared to give, but our, for our guests, we would ask that you just simply drop that uh, card into that box so that we can, we can have that, or if you prefer, you can hand it to me after the service. Either way, is fine. But what I would also like to emphasize, and this is not announcement time, but I do want to mention this because you may, you may, I may forget later, and uh, that is... We do not have a sign-up sheet for the Biblical Mandate Conference coming up August 20th. It is available online, but if you could write your name and that you would like to register for that on this card and just turn it in today, that would be that would be suitable as well. All right. Our call to worship is Psalm 50. Psalm 50, verses 1 through 8, and then 22 and 23. Psalm says, the mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes, he does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire. Around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me, my faithful ones. Who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is judge. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. And then verses 22 and 23. Mark this then, you who forget God. Lest I tear you apart and there be none to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. A little later on in our scripture reading, we're going to see how God spoke through his prophet Isaiah against his people who were making a mockery of his worship and were not right in their hearts before him. This is about being having a right heart attitude in worship, regardless of the outward. And it's important. The outward form is also also has some importance to it. But without the inward attitude of the heart, a heart of worship, a heart of praise, a heart of thanksgiving, it's it is as nothing. So I want to encourage you, worship the Lord this morning in spirit and in truth. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty God, you are greatly to be praised. And we magnify and worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We ask that you would accept our praise as we offer it to you through the finished work of the Lord Jesus, who himself knew no sin, but became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. How we love and praise you. We pray that you would accept this as we offer it to you through Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Come, come and lead us in congregation. Can you stand once again? We're going to continue to sing joyfully about the love of God. His love endures forever. Sing together. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever, for He is good, He is love all things. His love endures forever, sing praise, sing praise. With the mighty hand and outstretched arm, 
By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made of things that are visible. And then 4 through 7 speak of the faith of Abel, Enoch, and Noah. And then verse 8, pick, eight picks up again uh, talking about Abraham's faith. So verse 8. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she was considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them, greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland, if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. At some point, we'll have a report when they finally finalize how many people received Christ in trust at camp this week. How many trusted their lives to Christ? And I uh, just want to sing this song as a celebration of that. Victory in Jesus. They experienced that. So let's sing together.
of faith, which is really what victory in Jesus is. It's not really so much, it has less character as a song of praise and more of an affirmation of what God has done and is doing in our lives. Another affirmation of faith that we, that we have is our catechism, which is going to appear on the screen this morning. We're on questions 19 and 20 of the Baptist catechism. It's kind of a misnomer would probably to call it the Baptist Catechism. It's very similar to the Westminster with just a little uh, it's been baptized is what I'm trying to say. And Westminster is, is not. It uh, has pedo baptism or infant baptism but the, this is uh, this has adult or believer baptism as part of it among other things. So question 19 asks the question did all mankind fall in Adam's first sin? The answer is all mankind, descending from Adam by ordinary generation, sinned in him and fell with him in his first sin. Um, the next question, 20, asks, into what condition did the fall bring mankind? The answer, the fall brought mankind into a condition of sin and misery. And if you are wanting to, to have a little more, a little more, depth to those questions and answers on your back side of your insert there are scriptures that go along with each one of those and the sum commentary which you can uh, you can get the the wording has been updated a little bit and so instead of saying into what estate did the fall bring me say what condition it means the same thing but you may uh, you, you may use that word as well but it reminds us of who we are why we come to the Lord in need of forgiveness. Every one of us is brought into this world in sin, in this, in this condition. And we need a Savior because of what Adam did, but because also then of what we continue to do after, after that. There is actual sin that comes into our, into our lives because of that nature of sin. And so when Christ comes and gives us new birth, gives us new life, gives us a brand new start, he says we are a new creation created in Christ Jesus in two good works. We, we read that from Ephesians uh, 2 in our Bible school time a few uh, week or so, a couple weeks ago now. Uh, but the what God has done in us is not it only becomes because of what God has done for us in Christ. And so it's with that in mind that we approach the Lord in prayer this morning, and especially a time of confession, also a time of pastoral uh, prayer when we can bring our needs to the throne and bring our needs to the Father. So if you would join me, uh, you might choose to sit or to stand or to kneel during this time, whatever reflects your heart. But if you would, please join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, how thankful and grateful we are to be in this place and gathered as your people. Lord, we join with all the churches around the world, some of whom have already been worshiping you for, for many hours, and some of whom are still approaching that hour of, of gathered worship as the, as the assembly of your people. 
that we join with them, all the churches that preach your word, that teach your word, that whose faith is fully in you as both creator, savior, and sustainer. And Lord, we ask your blessing on all those who are worshiping you in spirit and in truth. And if there's any blessing left over, we pray that you would bestow it on us as well. Lord, we come to you recognizing our need for cleansing. Those of us who have trusted in the Lord Jesus already for the salvation, have received the free offer of forgiveness and partake, are partakers in that, have been justified freely by your grace, and we thank you for that. But we come to you for daily forgiveness, daily cleansing based on what Christ has done, and the fact that we are your children, have been adopted into your family, have been accepted into the blood, have been forgiven and cleansed and healed. Lord, we turn to you yet again for renewed forgiveness, renewed cleansing, renewed healing. We confess, Lord, that we have often transgressed your law and your ways. We come to you not because our sins are few, but because they are many. We come to you not because our sins are light in nature, but because they are heavy. <coughs> we come to you not because we can do anything at all about them, but because we are Weak, we are helpless and apart from Christ. There is nothing that we can do. Your word reminds us, you are the vine, we are the branches. And apart from you, we can do nothing. So it's with that sense of complete and total reliance upon you and the finished work of the Lord Jesus that we come to you. Asking once again, as we boldly approach your throne of grace, to receive your mercy in our time of need. We have full assurance of faith that you will grant it to us. And we thank you for it. Lord, we confess sins and iniquity of our nation. We pray that you would turn us as a nation back to you. Lord, that we would have an interest in seeing your kingdom expanded. The borders of your kingdom extended through the preaching and the teaching of your word. That we as your people would have a sense of, of responsibility to obey your commission. Not only to love you with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself, but also to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all the things that you have commanded. Lord, may we do this with joy and passion and a renewed vigor and desire to walk today in a new obedience. Lord, may it truly be that the old has passed away and the new has come in each life. But Lord, we do pray for those who have yet to trust in Christ as Lord and Savior, who have yet to repent of their sins. Draw them to yourself, we pray, and cause new life to begin. And we ask all of these things in the precious and holy name, the name of Jesus, for his sake. Amen. In Psalm 34, these words of great grace and assurance and pardon. Verse 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Amen. second part of our teaching that had to do with the scripture that the kids said earlier, deny ourselves 
take up his cross and follow him. And so we not only shared the scriptures about becoming a Christian and uh, trusting Christ for salvation, but also what comes after that. We, we walk and we follow and we take those steps that build on that foundation. And so this song that we sang for our, kind of our second theme song almost, says uh, it's called uh, Upon the Word of God. And so I want to sing it together. Uh, it's really uh, easy to learn and kids know the actions. If they start doing actions next to you, uh, join them if you want. But let's stand together and sing this song. And it just says, On the Word of God. I will build my house upon the rock through obedience to the word, the word of God. I will build. So if you have your Bible, I hope that you do. If you have a print, print edition, turn to Luke 13. Or if you have your electronic version, turn to, I uh, can't really say turn. What do you do? Scroll through it? We're back to tabbing and scrolling now. The Bible started out on scrolls. Now we're back to scrolling through the Bible on our apps. Have you ever thought that so much of what we say today would not have made sense to someone 10 years ago? And yet, we take it for granted today. We're going to be begin reading in verse 10. And this is the very first thing that we're going to do this morning is give attention to, uh, to God's Word. So if you are able to stand in honor of God's Word, thank you, Randy. I would encourage you to do so at this time if you're able to. And we will read through verse 21. I think that my, my dryness in my throat has something to do with yelling at camp all week long. So that's, that's what I'm sticking to. Uh, but it uh, was a joy, really a joy to be 
with young people and to sing these, to hear them lifting their songs, lifting their voices in song to the Lord and to sing about building their lives upon the word of God. And of course, we emphasize to them how important it is to, to truly do that uh, at this time in their lives, making those critical um, decisions to follow as a disciple of the Lord. So we'll read verses 10 through 21 of chapter 13 of Luke's gospel. Verse 10 says, Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. This is speaking of Jesus. And there was a woman who had, had had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, there are six days on which, in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. And all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like and to what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden and it grew and became a tree and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. And again, he said to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. This is the word of God for the people of God. May he inscribe its eternal truths on our hearts that we might follow hard after him. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We want to spend these brief moments in God's word thinking about what Jesus has done in this, in this passage. Remember from our last study that Jesus is teaching on the importance of genuine conversion. In fact, what does he say? He says that conversion is so important, he urges it in the strongest possible terms. What does he say in verse 5? He says, repent or what? Repent or what? Yeah, perish. It's okay. It's okay. This, this is a response time. And I ask you to respond. It's really, really okay to go ahead and respond. But repent or perish. That's strong language, isn't it? There's nothing weak about that. There's nothing retiring about that in, G, in terms of Jesus' ministry. So he urges this strong term, repent or perish. Yet, what did his opponents do? Did they repent? No, largely not. Largely what we see in Scripture is not only did they not repent, what did they do? They dug in their heels and did exactly what they wanted to do, what they continued to do. And so they did not repent. We see that in this account, especially as it applies to the synagogue leader. Your translation may say the president of the synagogue. It may say the, the, the ruler of the synagogue. He was the one who was over the, the, uh, the arrangements of the synagogue. Probably not the rabbi. Probably not the one who, was in, who actually did the majority of the teaching. But he was in charge of making all those arrangements. He led the synagogue, as it were. The synagogue, if you remember, we think of it as a Jewish place of worship today. But really, what is it? It's a house of prayer. It's a house of study. Uh, the, the Jews of Jesus' time would not have thought of the synagogue as a place of worship. They would have thought of it as a place to go for prayer. 
They would have thought of it as a place to go hear the word of God proclaimed. And a lot of it sounds like a worship service to us. But for them, worship was at the temple in Jerusalem. It was something that you went to at certain times of the year. But the synagogue was the weekly place, the daily place. If you were able to, as a Jewish man, you could spend as much uh, time in the synagogue as you possibly could. And particularly, though, on those Sabbath days, there would be the preaching and the teaching of the Torah and of the, the rest of the scripture, but particular focus on the law. So instead of accepting Christ, the leader did not. He did not yield to the authority of Jesus. Instead, he opposed and rejected Jesus. But what does Jesus do here? Well, Jesus shows his authority as king over all of life. That's what he's been doing in his preaching and teaching. That's what he's been doing in his healing ministry. That's what he's been doing in his, in his miracles. Everything that we see in scripture that is ascribed as a miracle of Jesus is actually a sign. He uses it as a sign to show his authority, to show his kingship, to show his rulership over all of creation, all of, all of, over all the world. And here he shows his authority over an infirmity, a sickness, as we see in just a moment. But he has authority as king over all of life. And he shows that authority in three ways. And I've listed them for you in your, in your study guide. And we're just going to be looking at them briefly this morning. And he does so by application of his authority, by explanation of his authority, and by illustration of his authority. Now, those of you who have had experience preaching and teaching God's word over the, over the course of years will recognize that, that application and e illustration and explanation are what you're supposed to do when you stand up to preach and teach God's word. Those are really the three elements that you think of in terms of what you're doing with the word of God. Three sections to a standard sermon, if you will. Although usually the order is different. Usually a preacher will explain the text First, this is what the Puritans referred to as the doctrinal section. What's the doctrine of the text? What's the teaching of the text? And explain that. And then, then illustrate what he, what he explains by means of examples from creation or examples from other scriptures or word pictures or stories and the like. Now, the illustration is not ever meant to supplant the explanation of God's word or the application of it, but merely to serve as a window on the word. Just as an aside, I know that stories are memorable, but if the stories and the examples draw more attention to themselves than they do to the teaching of the word, then you're better off not to have a story. Preacher, did you really say that? Yeah. Illustrations are great. Illustrations are wonderful. Personal examples, I think, can serve the text. They can serve the teaching. But I have been in places where I left being more impressed by that story or that example than I was by the underlying teaching. So just a word of a word of uh, admonition there when it comes to illustrations. And it's back on me as well. The temptation as a preacher or a teacher of God's word is to come up with a really great hook to, to get you involved. And, and it is important to get our to focus our attention on the word of God. But it is so easy to get caught up in the in that thought of I've really got to come up with a wow story. The illustration is a, is a necessary part, but very often it is from other parts of Scripture. And we'll see that as, as we go through this passage today. Then lastly, the preacher applies the doctrine of the text to life. And this is what, again, referring to the Puritans, they typically refer to this as the uses of the doctrine uses of the scripture and so the preacher might have uh, uses that numbered in the tens or the twenties this is why they preached for an hour and a half or two hours at a time you know you're not going to get that today yeah. today in fact it's going to be shorter than normal that's my aim and i i always hesitate 
to make that public, but but we do want to uh, uh, we do want to give our our attention to uh, special guests this morning who have uh, who want, need to share about what their ministry is about. I want to make sure and leave time for that as well and for you all. But just to say. This is the application part. And so in a pure sermon, if you're reading it, it will say use one, use two, use three. Very often you'll see that. So let's look at the passage today and see how Jesus shows his authority as king. First, by application, by application. This was through the physical and spiritual healing that we see of this woman. And so Jesus is here teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And by the way, this is the last time we see Jesus teaching in a synagogue in Luke's gospel. Most likely, it was just a few months before his crucifixion. You look at that and you go, wow, but we still have like you know eight chapters or nine chapters to go. When you're looking at a gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, anywhere from a third to half of the space is usually taken up with the final week of Jesus' ministry, his crucifixion, his, his burial, and his resurrection. So that is always the focus of it. This is leading up to that. He is out teaching. He's doing what he ordinarily did as part of his ministry. On this occasion, Jesus was teaching, and a woman who had been disabled by a spirit was there. Now, this is, this is one of those situations where she obviously has a physical malady. And this had apparently been a fusing of the bones in her back to cause her to be in a permanently stooped position. And it says that she was like this, had been like this for 18 years. Now this is a, this is historical fact that she was like this for 18 years, but it's also something I believe that Luke is using to, to help people to remember this detail. And to distinguish her from maybe the woman who had the flow of blood for 12 years. And remember, as we looked at the woman who had the flow of blood for 12 years, that that's adjacent to the raising of, uh, I believe it was Jairus' daughter who was 12, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that. There was a 12-year-old who was raised, and then she had had the flow of blood for 12 years. This, 18 years of a fused spine, follows on the account when the people said, what about those 18 Galileans who who died, who were who were crushed or who died, and so you see the connection to, to help as a sort of a memory device. But that does not supplant the historical truth of it that she had been like this for eighteen years. Just it helps to remember, helps us to remember that she was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. She couldn't stand completely up. My my visual of this is that she would be stooped over in such a way that it would probably have been painful for her even to lift up her eyes. So this is the this is her situation. And this spirit of infirmity evidently was something that was a demonically influenced infirmity, but the, it's it's hard to say that she was possessed of a spirit. She doesn't have the a lot of the other indicators that we see when Jesus is actually casting out a demon and he treats it more like a healing. He says, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. This term woman is, is just, it, it's a term of respect. It's not a term of derision at all. Jesus spoke to his own mother that way at the cross. He said, woman, behold your son. And to John, behold your mother, he said. So this is a term of, of respect that he shows to her. And he says, you are loose. You are freed. You are, you are turned loose from this infirmity. And she immediately, that says, was healed. He called her over and said this. He laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight. And what was her response? Praise! She glorified God. She glorified God. We also give God the glory for the authority of Christ and the application of that authority for both physical and spiritual healing. I believe that the Lord is sovereign over all of that today. We see, we see it mostly in the spiritual side when folks are brought from death to life. There's no greater miracle. When Jesus said, greater works than these shall you do. That's what he was talking about. 
They didn't see too many people raised from death to life. A few. They saw lots of healings of infirmities, but those people would be raised from their infirmity to go on and to eventually die. But when we are raised to life in Christ, we have that new life. We are never to die spiritually again. And so this is a, a, a woman that received that healing from Jesus, but also an incredible spiritual healing, I believe, was attendant to that as well. So as this is going on, he does this. He performs this miracle, but then we have another element of his authority. He shows his authority as king by explanation, which is the divine interpretation of the law of God. Just look at verse 14. Verse 14. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, there are six days on which to work, or which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. <laughs> now, I don't know if anyone else gets the irony of this. But it's so ironic for him to say, stop, don't do this, not on the Sabbath, come on the other six days, but don't come on the Sabbath. Now, what's wrong with that? What he's doing is he's saying that this healing is work and work cannot be done on the Sabbath. What do we know? From scripture. It's exactly what, Je what Jesus says. He says, the Lord answered him, you hypocrites. That indicates to me it wasn't just the, wasn't just the leader. He had others with him. And interestingly, it's not a Pharisee or a, or a Sadducee or a teacher of the law here. It's just the president of the synagogue. This was perhaps out somewhere, not, in, not around Jerusalem, but out in an area called Perea. That was the ministry that he was engaged in, in that area, which was kind of north and east of Jerusalem. But he says, you hypocrites. You ones that say one thing and do another. You people that walk around with spiritual masks on so you can sin and yet you pretend not to be. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger, manger and lead it away to water? In other words, don't you take care of necessities? Don't you take care of those acts of, of need, even for your own animals? And yet, this woman, a daughter of Abraham, a daughter of the covenant, a respectable woman in your synagogue has a great need and you say, leave and don't come back until another day. When the Sabbath, Jesus would also say, is made for man and not man for the Sabbath. In fact, a little later on, that's exactly, he mentions this uh, when someone asks him directly. One of the, the, the lawyers and the Pharisees said in, in chapter 14, verse 3, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Jesus asked that question of them. They remained silent. It's one of those situations where if we say whatever we say, it's going to be the wrong thing. And then he took him, meaning he took this uh, in verse, in verse four, uh, chapter 14, one Sabbath when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. So this is the man with dropsy. He took him and he healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day? will not immediately pull him out. And they could not reply to these things. This is why Christians, from the time, certainly from the time of the Reformation on, have said that acts of mercy and necessity are always exceptions to this idea of, of not working on the Sabbath or on the Christian Sabbath, on the Lord's Day. We might seek to avoid to do the, the work that we do on the other days and hold it as, as a special day, a day devoted to worship and devoted to, de, to acts of devotion and devoted to reading the Word of God and, and reading uh, Christian uh, encouraging books and, and to spending time in fellowship with other believers, but also to acts of mercy, 
Visiting those who are ill and infirm. Visiting those who are sick. Visiting those who are in nursing homes and hospitals. Visiting those who are at home and not able to get out. And ministering to them. And to pray for their healing. We may not go around healing as Jesus did. But we certainly can pray for that. So this is the explanation. Jesus' divine interpretation of the law simply goes back to what the law said. You can do all of these things if your ox is in the ditch, if your, if your uh, son has fallen into a well. You're not going to leave him there because it's a Sabbath. I'm sorry, I can't do work. No, you go to great lengths to make that happen. Jesus is applying the gospel, the good news to this woman. Don't you know that she left there with rejoicing? Because of what Jesus had done. It says that, in fact, that she had done. He says, this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for 18 years. There, there's how we, how we know it was, uh, there's a spiritual aspect to this. Not that all infirmities were like this. But it says, as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. And all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. This verse even emphasizes to me the kingship of Christ in a way that might not be readily apparent. When it says, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. It recalls to my mind the anointing of Solomon as king. When Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anointed Solomon king, what does it say? And all the people rejoiced and said, God save the king. God save the king. Long live the king. And that's what we say about Christ. He is our king. May he live as he truly does. He is the resurrected king. We don't even have to say God save the king. He is the one who saves us. May we continue to believe and to trust that. This is Jesus giving his divine interpretation of the law and explaining this is what this is how we need to understand it. And then he moves to the illustration. Jesus shows his authority as king by means of an illustration of that authority. And he uses two, two illustrations from creation, mustard seed and the leaven or the yeast. And so what does he say about the mustard seed? He asks what is the kingdom of God like? So he makes a comparison. What shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a tree. And the birds of the air made nests in its branches. Now how, boys and girls, how big is a mustard seed? Does anybody know? Is it tiny? It's tiny. This says the smallest of the seeds. Now, today we know there's a lot tiny, lot smaller seeds that you would plant, but it is tiny. There is no doubt. It is among the smallest. And yet, from that small seed, what grows? This calls it a tree. It's probably a very large herb. But big enough for the tree, for the uh, birds to rest, to, to rest in its branches. Prophet Ezekiel talks about the, about the cedar tree of Lebanon being taken and, and planted in, 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 the, uh, in the nation of the Lord and the birds of the air of all the nations coming to flock and to rest in its branches. Well, the mustard tree is not like a cedar tree. It's a little more humble than that. And yet, Jesus said, birds of the air make nests in its branches. Something so small and hidden in the ground becomes something of great, great importance. And then the second illustration is that of leaven or yeast. To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leaven. Now look this up. Three measures of flour is most likely about 60 pounds. I asked my wife, how much do you need, how much flour do you need to make a loaf of bread? And what did you tell me? Two and a half cups. Around a pound, we'll say, just for the round numbers. 
May or be more or less than that. So just imagine she's making 60 loaves of bread or a gigantic loaf of bread. Jesus uses this sort of hyperbole, I think, to get people's attention. Three measures of flour and yet a little bit of leaven hides in that flour and goes through the whole amount of flour and goes through all of the dough. And what happens with the leaven in the dough? It rises and it becomes something wonderful to eat. He's emphasizing the kingdom. He's emphasizing his kingship. And he's saying it's small. It's little. The kingdom starts out imperceptibly in hearts. It starts out being this hidden thing. And it doesn't come all at once. It comes little by little by little. But eventually, it's something much, much greater. And this is what he's saying. He's introducing them to the kingdom. He is the king. How do we know that the kingdom is present? Because the king is present. And just as we, as we see the kingdom becoming present in the life and the ministry of Jesus, we know that it's not completed. It's already in some ways, but not yet. It's inaugurated, but not consummated. That will come over time as people are swept into the kingdom. People who are converted to Christ. People repent and believe on Christ. And the, the church is really uh, uh, the, where the kingdom of God is growing. In this world, we have this mandate to go and make disciples of all the nations. That is kingdom work. So as we look at these questions for reflection and application, I just want to draw your attention to them. We have a synagogue leader here who rejected Jesus as his person and his ministry. He rejected Christ. And I want to ask you, how do you respond? To those who reject the person and the work of Christ. How do you respond to them? There will be those who reject Jesus. How do you talk to them? How do you witness to them? How do you speak to them? How do you share the gospel with them? It's something we all need to be able to answer. And as we mentioned just a moment ago, in one sense the kingdom of God is already here. In another sense it is not yet. But from this passage we see that the kingdom doesn't come all at once, but we see a glorious example of it here in the woman who was raised from her infirmity, and then the examples of the mustard seed and the yeast. In what ways do you see the kingdom of God on display today, and where does it need to be further displayed? That's what we need to ask ourselves. What am I doing as an individual to put God's kingdom on display Christ's lordship his kingship over my life yes but also in any area that I have influence over how is how is Christ impacting my work my school wherever I might be this is the kingdom of God let's pray together our heavenly father how we love and praise you we thank you for these words and we thank you for the ministry of Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that as the ministry of Christ continues through the ministry of your Holy Spirit, that it would be that he would be about his work of changing hearts and lives, of bringing conviction of sin and righteousness and judgment, of reminding us and teaching us all things that Jesus said and did that we might announce the good news, that we might be emissaries of your kingdom, that we might be proclaimers of your gospel. And Lord, we know that that often includes the preaching of the law to bring conviction of sin and to remind us of, the, of, the, of what God requires and to recognize that Jesus has fulfilled it all. May we live in the light of that truth. And Lord, may you be about your work today, drawing people to yourself, changing hearts and lives, making people brand new, making the dead live. We pray all of these things in Jesus' precious name.
Amen. Amen. God comes to lead us in our hymn of response. Let's stand together as we as we sing. And if there is a, a public response that you need to make to the Lord today, I would encourage you to do so. I'll be here to pray with you, to, to counsel with you, whatever it might be the need as we sing. You come. Facebook, so we bid farewell to our Facebook uh, congregation. It's not really a congregation, but those who are joining us by way of, of Facebook, and thank you for being with us this morning. So, just a couple of things from Kyle, and we're going to ask a man, Kyle, to, to share. Just a couple of reminders tonight bring your family, bring your neighbors. We're going to have just a fun time of uh, watching a movie. You don't have to drive through St. Joe, uh, you don't have to go that far. Just come down here and we'll watch a uh, comedy movie, Mom's Night Out. And it should be really fun. Bring a comfy chair. We're actually going to be in the other room. So bring your lawn chair. We're going to have some uh, chairs, but nothing's like a good lawn chair. So bring that. Um, we're going to have uh, next Sunday, carrying in meal for lunch. And so bring uh, all your favorites and your friends' favorites. And we're going to eat together. And we're going to have a short members meeting following that. And we need some classes or some people to yes, if you would, if you would be spirit there, that. Need a crew. Need yeah. a crew to to kind of just make sure things are set up, set out, and uh, I think we're going to try to provide drinks so we can part of that and clean up. So if you or your class or your family or uh, your Bible study group wants to do that or you just want to do it, come and uh, I guess you can catch me after church and I'll, I'll write you down. Uh, Biblical Mandate Conference is coming up the 20th, just a couple of weeks away, um, as Greg mentioned earlier. So if you want to be a part of that, give us the information on your tear-off sheet and drop it in the box or we'll get Pastor Greg calling. If you would like to be a part of that, guys, that costs us $25. And uh, if $25 is keeping you from going, let us know. We've got people that want to send it. So um, that's it. Keep playing, praying about kids' clubs. All right.